How body about face. This is our opening reception for the exhibition, which is now on view in our gallery space at the Artist Archives of the Western Reserve. I'm Mindy Towsley, and I'm your host for tonight. I'm the executive director of the Artist Archives. Uh, before we start, I would like to introduce uh, my staff, Kelly Pontoni and Megan Elves. And um, let's see if we can. Okay, I'm just going to go into a grid so perhaps you can see them up there. We have some of our artists who are waiting. And um, I would like to thank our funders, the Bernice and David E. Davis Art Foundation, the George Gunn Foundation, the William Bingham Foundation, the Cleveland Foundation, the Zupol Foundation, Ohio Arts Council, and Cuyahoga Arts and Culture, which represents the voters of Cuyahoga County. Um, so I'm going to turn this over to Megan, and she's going to just talk to you a little bit about how Zoom works, for those of you who aren't sure. And, um, and then we'll go into um, a little talk about the curation of the show, and I'll share some more slides of the show for you. And then we will introduce the artists who will have a chance to talk to each of you directly, followed by questions and answers monitored by Megan. So Megan, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Awesome, great. So hello everyone, welcome to our Zoom presentation this evening. This is the opening reception for uh, About Body, About Face. And I'm sure all of you are very familiar with Zoom at this point, probably painfully so. Uh, but let me just give you a little bit lay of the land and some tips and tricks how to do it. So um, we have it in active speaker view. So you'll see the screen share from Mindy and who is ever speaking. Uh, and that way we'll just keep the focus on things. So we have that covered for you. Uh, important thing is that there is chat at the bottom of the screen. Position can change, but it's gonna be a little speaking bubble. And then that chat, you can either use the drop down menu to say uh, panelists, which is gonna be us, or panelists and attendees. Now that's going to be everybody who's in the presentation. So we ask that you use chat just a little sparingly while the artists are talking, just so that you know, the focus stays on them but we will put links and different things in there. Now, the most important feature is going to be the Q&A. So we will actually be asking the artists questions at the end of the presentation. So if you have questions for any of our artists tonight, go ahead and click that and be sure to preface the question with the artist's name and that way we'll know. And so we'll try to get to all of them at the end of the presentation. Uh, outside of that, um, I think that should be it for the Zoom presentations. And remember, do put those questions in there, and we look forward to having you tonight. Thank you so much. Here's back to Mindy Towsley. Thanks, Megan. Um, so our first slide is a picture of the artists who are in the Scene Unseen show. All of the artists who are in About Body and About Face were part of the Scene Unseen exhibition. This is a nice group shot that we took um, at the end of the show of everybody. So, and this is another shot of Scene Unseen and there's Amanda King in the foreground and some of the other artists, um, Devon who's with us tonight and Christy Copez is in the background there um, where they all got a chance to talk a little bit about their work to the crowd. Um, I just wanna say that the Scene Unseen exhibition pointed out to me uh, as the curator of About Body, About Face that the work of so many artists regionally was based on figure. And it seemed natural to do a figurative show of a small selection of the, of the artists from Scene Unseen. Um, why did we do a small selection instead of doing another big group show? Well, our gallery space is fairly small. As those of you who have been there know, it's 1,100 square feet. And while we do put on large group exhibitions with one piece by each artist, it's really preferable to be able to show a few works by smaller amount of artists so that you can really see a little bit more about what the artists are about. Um, so there were many artists from Scene Unseen who do really amazing work who are not included in this small About Body, About Face exhibition. Um, hopefully we will include their work in future exhibitions. Um, Mariah Johnson, for instance, from Scene Unseen was included in the Art and Thread, which uh, we did during the summer. Um, why these particular artists? I was personally interested in the artists whose use of the figure as the basis for their work went beyond strict realistic depictions or technically beautiful portraiture 
and moved into other kinds of interpretations. Um, I did want a range of styles for the work. And so you can see that we have painting, we have drawing, we have paper, uh, handmade paper and batiking. There are mosaics, um, there is photography, there is installation work. So it really is a good variety of work. Personally, as a curator, I'm interested in showing variety of artwork in an exhibition that pushes the limits while still maintaining some kind of balance. Um, so the work made in a variety of materials, all these different materials I just mentioned, pushes the boundaries of the exhibition a little bit. And I feel personally it adds more interest while the recurring themes that cross over between the works create balance. And without balance, you have chaos. And without differences, you have boredom. So hopefully when you come into the gallery space and see the show, um, you'll feel good about it. Uh, the installation in the gallery and the physical positioning of the work um, hopefully we'll point over to this crossover and give you some clues to the underlying themes and styles. Um, here we have a piece by Amanda King in the foreground and the pieces by Devon in the background. Both of these works have historical art historical references that point out the inequities of Western art history, which has been written mainly by white male historians. Um, the examination of the body as subject through gesture and body language and the body as object and objectification specifically of women's bodies is a theme that also crosses over. And here there are uh, uh, digital photographs by Yvonne in the background and Amanda in the foreground. Um, there is self-portraiture and the need to show inner self and inner strength beyond the depiction of realism but through symbolism and abstraction. And that also is a theme that is run concurrently throughout the show. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now and we are going to start introducing the artist to you. Our first artist up is gonna be Lawrence Baker and we're just gonna take artists alphabetically tonight. Um, Lawrence is an archived artist. He holds an MFA and an MA from Kent State University and a BFA from Kent State as well. Um, he shows his work mainly nationally on the national stage. He is in the permanent collection of the Wilberforce University, the Springfield Museum of Art, Mississippi Valley State University, and East Cleveland Public Library, as well as the artist archives of the Western Reserve. He's the recipient of the 2018 Paula Krasner Foundation Grant Award and a 2019 Ohio Arts Council Artist with Disabilities Access Program Award. And so Lawrence, um, I'm gonna turn it over to you and if you could tell us a little bit more about yourself, what you're doing and about your work in general, we'd love to hear from you. Um, my name is uh, Lawrence Baker. Currently I'm working on a project for the Cleveland area where there's a series of uh, Afro-American artists we are putting together what's called Crossroads. And the, the objective is to uh, do augmented reality. And um, I didn't understand it. I knew I had to research it. There's an artist in California that does, does this, what we call so-called augmented reality. And I'm working on that project uh, currently. Now, uh, where does my experience, what influenced me? Um, I would have to say um, Alex Katz is one that influenced me. Um, Jacob Lawrence and Fairfield Porter. Uh, I understand because I've been at this so long when you try to put uh, piece of artwork together is more so than just a picture. That is the reason you see some kind of uh, background in, in the painting uh, so that the uh, total figure is complete. Now, that particular figure is my son and he happens to be 40 years old now. So that's his that'll give you a clue how long 
ago that I completed that painting. Uh, I paint in terms of uh, shapes so that it reads as, a, reads, uh, reads as a volume. I've learned that this is my this is my direction where I'm going in terms of adding in um, landscape. I'm, I'm approaching it to complete the composition so that you move across the page uh, across the canvas. So you take in the entire canvas as uh, not part of it, but taking the entire canvas. And there's uh, uh, there are directional elements within the painting itself to carry you, your eye across the canvas. Um, I put together like I read a book from left to right. And you'll notice that the shapes read across the canvas. That's, that's what I was trying to do with that. And I'm just beginning to add in the landscape shapes so, to complete the uh, canvas. The, the yellow, I call a lady in, in yellow, uh, jacket. It happens to be my wife, but uh, I like the yellow because the if you notice even the uh, variations in the yellow, there is a connection between the other colors that you see around the figure, so that it becomes a total uh, composition. That's that's what I'm trying to do with that. Okay, so. This particular drawing, um, the, this one has more landscape in it, and that's deliberate, so that the uh, it appears to have an entire uh, completed composition. That particular drawing was accepted in a national competition at um, Florida A and M University. They actually did a uh, a catalog of those uh, pieces of artwork from all over the country, so I felt good about that. And that's not the that's closer to one of the drawings where I started transitioning into landscape. So, uh, if you look at it, you see the variations in the line. Uh, line weight becomes important. Um, in drawing. Anyone that draws a lot should know that. Uh, if the work appears to be too flat, then you know that you're doing something wrong. Line weight becomes important. Where you place those lines and any lines that you put in the drawing, they must uh, show some kind of significance rather than just filling in a space. Don't just fill in a space. Make sure that you complete the drawing so that all aspects of the line become useful tools to completing to completing the drawing. So I'm okay. I made up a lot of that as I went, but that that's what I'm doing. Thanks, Lawrence. Um, I will say about Lawrence's work, he has pretty exclusively moved from painting into drawing um, in recent years. And, um, you know, I really enjoy pulling the paintings out from his storage because oftentimes an artist, uh, what they work on most recently is the thing that everyone wants to see and shows want to accept. But, you know, um, artists' careers are long. And just because the work is older doesn't mean that it's lesser work than the work that they're doing now. And I think it's really important um, that that work is, is brought out and shown to the public. And that's really part of what the archives mission is, is to show the whole of the artist's career. And so, um, so that's why those pieces were chosen for the show, as well as the transitional painting and one of the early drawing pieces, which goes into uh, the landscape drawing that Lawrence does now. So I kind of thought that needed a little bit of an explanation there um, for Lawrence's work. Um, so our next artist up is Devon Brantley. He's a 2018 graduate of the Cleveland Institute of Art. 
He's been an instructor for continuing education at the Cleveland Institute of Art, as well as working for the Wasmer Gallery and Ursuline College. Um, in 2020, he's completed several mural projects. He recently participated as one of the artists who worked on the Black Lives Matter mural on East 93rd Street here in Cleveland, as well as a mural for the Westside Catholic Center and a Road to Freedom mural at 90 Willis Street in Bedford, Ohio. He is an emerging artist, I would say, who's at the beginning of his career. Um, he does fabulous work and um, you're gonna see a piece that he's working on currently that's behind him in his home. And also I should mention that he has work up at May Halls in Lakewood, Ohio right now. And you can make appointments to go to May Halls and see that work too, as well as coming to the archive. Devon, welcome to the reception for About Body, About Face. Hi everybody. Um, thank you, Mindy, Mindy, for that wonderful introduction. Um, and also thank everyone um, who are participating today and watching us and all the artists involved as well too. Um, my name is Davon Brantley. Uh, I have a piece I'm working on behind me, which I'll go into more in depth when you know I give my artist talk a little bit later with you guys and stuff. Um, but yeah, I work primarily in self-portraiture. Um, I talk about the psychological and how childhood trauma affects a person. Um, within their childhood up until their adulthood. Um, so a lot of my work is about my experiences and others' experiences as well. Um, and talking about, you know, the African-American experience and more of a mythological type of sense within my artwork. Because um, a lot of our experiences are very much real, um, but within, you know, this space now in 2020, a lot of people, think that our experiences are like unfathomable unfathomable and also just very blatant blatant lies and stuff so um i play on those dark fantasies that a lot of those opposing viewpoints have um and so with dancing with death um the title of it came from my experiences and meditations on my body and what it's experienced with death how close i have gotten um to death as well too. Um, and just a lot about how complex and how beautiful it can be and how disturbing it can be as well too. There's a lot of different hands that can participate um, within, you know, being alive and being on the verge of death as a black man. So there's a lot of complex issues that I talk about within that piece. Um, so it's, Primarily in charcoal um, and on sepia tone paper, I kind of allow my work to breathe in an environment of itself. So I do not add environments into you know, my drawings or my paintings unless it necessarily has to in order to solidify the meaning into it. Um, but a lot of my work are very large scale. Um, so that is very confrontational and that you aren't easily distracted by something else going in the background or something beside it. Um, you have to confront the issue, which a lot of us don't necessarily do. Um, and with my on-site piece as well too, um, another thing about my work is that I use a lot of Renaissance and Baroque approaches to creating my artwork. So you'll see a lot of realism within my pieces. You'll see a lot of extreme and exaggerated shadows and lights um, within there as well to pay homage to Caravaggio and uh, painters like Da Vinci, Michelangelo, all of them um, to where you can think about those eras of painting and there's a lack of the black body present within it um, as if we cannot relate to the stories that they're telling or as if our presence within that painting is like a bother or it's something as if if we are in those spaces we're usually depicted in a negative light as well too so a lot of my pieces um grab from the renaissance and baroque areas of art history um and i use a lot of modern symbols within my pieces as well too like, like for the red halo you can think about the halos that have been used in the renaissance art but also 
the fact that it's red and it's a dot has a different context to a black person as well. And then you have the black square behind the body as well too, which um, if you know about all of the police brutality that has been going on within 2020, we had the blackout um, in order to pay respects to those people who are affected by it. Um, but there's also a dual sense to that and a negative light to that because we often ignore the fact that people are ignoring our bodies and they're just blinking out of space. Um, and people aren't really gravitating to the issues at hand. So I made the body super present. I'm hoping I'm not like speeding through this. I know I only have like five minutes, but uh, <laughs> just wanted to make sure everyone gets like a summary of my artwork and stuff. I the best I can. <laughs> Thanks, Devon. Really appreciate that. Gorgeous work, beautiful drawings. And those drawings that are in the gallery are more than life size. They are really, really impressive. Our next artist up is Jaquez P. Jackson. Jaquez is also an emerging artist whose career began in Atlanta, Georgia. He studied at the Art Institute of Atlanta to acquire skills, uh, basic art skills, and graphic design. And he has now returned back to his hometown of Cleveland, Ohio. And after several years of working through um, his path in art, um, he has been producing the Body Body Collection, um, which are the mosaics that we have in the gallery space. Some recent shows that he's in include um, a show that's up at the Beachwood Community Center. Um, he's shown at Ramparts Gallery at 78th Street at the Yards Project at Worthington Yards and um, at the Hub Art Factory in Canton, Ohio. So his work has mainly been seen in Ohio to date. Um, he does try and make a living as an artist from his work. He sells his work online. I'm going to give him a little plug here. It's www.jaquezpjackson.com. You can also find him on Instagram and Twitter and you can look for Soul House Decor, I think, as a hashtag name. And I think he might have another show coming up that he might want to tell you about. And um, so, Jaquez, uh, welcome to About Body, About Face. I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Minnie. I was, I was wondering uh, how my introduction would go after Lawrence Baker's was so outstanding. But he has a few years on me, so I'm not too worried about it. Um, the uh, Body Body Collection started a few years ago. Uh, I'm, really, I'm really a woodworker at heart, but I'm not the best woodworker, so I need to embellish, and I decided to embellish with mosaic. I chose bodies because it's one thing that universally we have in common. We have a body. Everyone has a body. And there are so many different types of bodies and different shapes. And that, that allowed me to express uh, different stories just using the bodies. Uh, showing now is this, the sash. And she's, she's kind of a matriarch of my collection. Uh, she's wearing a very colorful dress. And there's a symbolism that's going on in just one stone. Uh, it's a Janyami symbol, which means uh, without God, I could do nothing. And she just represents um, the mother of my collection. In my collection, you'll see other women who are postured as if they are dancing and they, you know, they may be in a nightclub scene. And she's just the kind of woman that is, you know, the woman that's at home. She, she's raised these young women, and that's her story. Early on, when I first started creating these bodies, I realized that I could tell stories about the people within the artwork. So within this scene here, you see the plus size model. She's she's showing a, a little extra skin in her high split skirt because she wants to be noticed by those gentlemen in, in the club. So I tell that story. And, and so for collectors, 
you kind of want to collect more than one piece so that you can put together your own story and, and just oppose those males against the females and, and, and create your own scene. Uh, many of the men, while not shown in this one, many of the men uh, have their genitals showing and they catch people by surprise. I, I noticed people, they start to look and it was like, wow, oh, you know, they didn't see it coming. And, and then it's, it's okay, you know, it's fun. Uh, this current piece showing now is uh, called Biggie Smalls, and he's one of the few uh, music artists, rap artists that just based on one photo, he, he wore a sweater called by a brand of Coogee sweater, and that became iconic for him. And I tried to create that, that look within the top of this mosaic here. Uh, the story with these guys is they're kind of a uh, x-ray vision. So the women are dancing, but at the same time, they're looking at these men and they're looking at what they're wearing, but they're also undressing them with their eyes. And so in that way, you can see what they're wearing and you can also see what's underneath their clothing. And I try to put some type of emphasis around the heart because the heart is very important when you, you're trying to choose a mate. And then the other emphasis is within the organs that, that work to procreate. And, and that's much about, um, much what is about my collection is to, to tell stories within the framework of the body. I don't think that's it. Thank you, Jaquez. Fabulous. Um, you will have to come into the gallery. I will say that I had a lot of fun um, installing this show, and um, I think I made up my own stories about your work when okay. I came up. So, um, <laughs> cool. and, I, and I love to hear those those stories. Yeah, yeah. When yeah, you come in, and I'll I'll tell you I'll tell you why I hung in the way I did. But you know, um, the great thing about a piece of artwork when you buy it and put it in your own home is, you know, you're free to to make your own stories for it at that point. Um, uh, so our next artist up is Amanda King. Um, Amanda was also part of Bridges and Barriers, or I would say that Shooting Without Bullets, um, which uh, she founded, was part of our Bridges and Barriers show, which just came down. She, as I said, she is the founder and creative director of Shooting Without Bullets. She's also a consultant for the Tamir Rice Afrocentric Cultural Center. Um, she's a Juris Doctorate at, from Case Western Reserve University Law School. She has a BA in art history as well. And she has studied abroad at the National School of Visual Arts in Paris. So I'm assuming that she also speaks French, which I didn't know until today. I'm gonna make her speak French for me sometime. Um, in 2019, her work was part of the Four Freedoms at the International Center of Photography in New York City, and she has also participated in the Front Triennial um, and the Book of Ashley Advocates for Youth in Washington, D.C. Some awards that she has won recently in 2019 include the Museum of Contemporary Art Cleveland New Agent Award, and the Verge Fellowship as part of the Cleveland Arts Prize. So Amanda, you do have a little bit of extra time. I'm just telling you, because I know you've got a lot to say. So I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you for coming. Hello everyone. Um, I'm Amanda D. King. I'm a visual artist, creative director. Um, I studied art history in, in, in college. And so it's very, near and dear to um, my heart and my interest, but also um, sort of the basis and under which I make art. Um, and my piece in this show is to be born again. And um, if you bring it up, um, to be born again is really a mixture of constructed images. So, um, a, a self-portrait of myself taken um, in a 
collaborative photo uh, photographic process with photographer Matt Chastney. Um, it was a, a self portrait that I created. Um, there is portraits of myself um, as a debutante, and so that is a is a constructed representational image of me um, uh, when I was a teenager. And it sort of borderlines, I guess, constructed in vernacular. And then the vernacular image of myself and my mother as a child in a gallery, in a gallery setting, um, in our full on, you know, black middle class garb. <laughs> um, and in each of these photos is white gloves. And I, throughout the installation, there's a lot of delicate white um, material that, that kind of um, references uh, my wearing of white gloves throughout my life. And then in the constructed portrait, having, being bound um, and wearing those white gloves was definitely in, in, intentional. The white gloves holding the, um, the brick that is in the foreground of the installation and thinking about the delicacy and the beauty of Black women, but also the burden. And I think that really what, um, to be born again, um, if you've ever, if you are in, into religion or to the Black church, to be born again means to be saved. And I really think that this particular installation is about salvation. Um, and in fact, I, I put a quote directly from Toni Morrison's Beloved, and it's on a tent card, um, but it says essentially salvation is as easy as a wish. And um, I think about um, representations of, uh, representational imagery of, of Black women in art history, but also how I've been represented throughout my life. And I think about the burden of chattel slavery within our representations, but how there's a clear desire and manifestation of salvation throughout those images. And so um, if you go to the next detail, these are represent representations of Black women in, in art history. And some of these, about half of these, most of them um, are uh, 19th century um, paintings, but um, half of them are, um, through the male gaze, uh, painting and sculpture through the male gaze and about the other half of them are representation um, of black women by black women. And so you have um, Edmania Lewis's, um, that's in the middle here, Edmania Lewis's uh, a depiction, it's sculpture of Hagar in the wilderness. You have Lorraine O'Grady's Mademoiselle Bourgeois Noir. Um, and then to the far right, which you can't see is uh, Carrie Mae Weems' uh, piece, not, um, not Manet's type. And anyway, so I'm looking at these, I'm looking at these representations and, and thinking about how there is both, how the presence of chattel slavery in our lives, which many of these um, pieces rep reference, um, puts us in this precarious situation where we are both, um, we're both trying, we're, our representations embody both trepidation and, and fear and constraint, but also resistance and um, salvation at the, other, at the other end of it. And um, I, I think that representations of Black women are something that there's been a lot of negation in art history. In our representation, we haven't been able to fully represent ourselves or to see ourselves represented by other people. And as a culture maker and artist, I want to sit at that tension. And um, the portrait of Matt, uh, that, that Matt, Matt Chastain it took of me in my studio is, is both, you see the male gaze in there because he is a white male photographer, but it is my controlling of the image um, and my representation. And I think that it was a quest for salvation. It was a quest for, um, throughout my life, 
Um, I, I didn't necessarily choose how I showed up in the world, but when I became an artist, I had more of a choice. And I think that um, my portrait, um, To Be Born Again, it suggests my desire to both um, reflect the past and past uh, representational imagery of Black women and past um, experiences of my ancestors who were, uh, who experienced chattel slavery and how that still impacts me today. And so there is bondage and there is trepidation and there is constraint, but there's also a loosening of it. You see that the the rope around um, my body and, and my arms and those gloves, it's not fully, I'm not fully constrained. And um, I'm closer to, I guess, salvation. Um, there's also in the, uh, in the work, this rope that is adorned with chrysanthemums, which is a direct reference to the reign of Brady's Mademoiselle Bourgeois Noir, which talks about the internal repression of, of, of Black middle-class women and, and trying to conform and to assimilate, but also the external oppression of Black people um, in the history, history of Western society. And um, O'Grady essentially went into, it was her first performance art piece, went into um, the gallery of the new museum and uh, actually whipped herself with a rope that was studded in chrysanthemums to um, to draw parallels to the tension between repression and um, oppression. And so I could, in my artist talk, I will go much deeper because I feel like I'm giving you the very, very surface level. But if I got into my parallels between every piece and my own representation, we'd be here all night. Thanks, Amanda. That was, that's, um, that was wonderful. Um, Amanda's work is so rich uh, with symbolism. Um, you really do have to come in and, and see it for a small piece. Um, it's incredibly complicated and um, we're really thrilled to have you as part of the exhibition. Thank you. Um, so our next artist uh, is Yvonne Pocklich and um, Yvonne, um, has an MA from the Mid-America Nazarene University in Massachusetts in organizational administration. Her exhibitions um, include exhibitions throughout Ohio, um, recently 2019 at the Art at the Hilton in Columbus, Ohio, and Love Your Skin in Stark County, Canton, Ohio. Um, she does show across the United States in group exhibitions including the International Women's Virtual Exhibit, uh, Women in Focus in Atlanta, Georgia. I think she's been in several of those. Uh, Photo Place Gallery in Middlebury, Vermont, Cultural Center of Cape Cod in Massachusetts, and the Pittsburgh Center for the Arts in Pennsylvania. Uh, recently, she completed commissioned work for the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra in the 2019 season. And if she's got anything else going for 2020, she can uh, let you know herself. And so um, we're really pleased to have her beautiful, beautiful photographs as part of the exhibition there. I believe we have six of them on view. And um, so I'm gonna turn it over to you, Yvonne. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Mindy. Thank you, everyone um, that I'm exhibiting with. It's been a pleasure working with the Artist Ar Archives. Um, uh, my name's Yvonne Pokowicz. And I am a conceptual photographer. I use my photography to tell emotive stories of women. Um, it's extremely important for me to uh, create images that capture a woman's story at a singular moment. And um, so I'm inspired uh, to create images that show her passion, um, her challenges um, and her triumphs. I am, uh, but most importantly, uh, I like to show uh, the moment that a change is unfolding. And um, in this particular image before me, um, it, it's, a, it's actually a celebration. 
piece. Um, it is uh, the moment of becoming and remembrance uh, of uh, my mother's before me. Uh, I, when I uh, created this piece, I was thinking of my mother and my grandmothers and their mothers and their mothers and those that prayed for me. So it was a celebration and, and a thank you uh, to those women. Um, and I, in hopes that my children and grandchildren will look back at these images and, and uh, appreciate them as well. Uh, I'm wanting to, uh, with my work, show um, not only a woman's story, but the connections, um, connections with others, uh, as uh, the previous image showed, but uh, with familiar, uh, that image, it shows a connection with yourself um, and loving yourself and um, being able to speak to yourself. And so uh, when I tell stories, those stories are coming from many women that I've encountered, um, uh, stories that I've heard around the kitchen table, um, friends in passing, and then just complete strangers who uh, sometimes will approach me and just begin to speak. And so I like to, to give homage to those stories and, uh, and create pieces uh, similar to familiar uh, where this particular young woman, uh, it was her 30th birthday. And I wanted to celebrate um, her and just allow her to, to speak to herself and, and just create that calming spirit as she enters into her new life moving forward. Um, and on my work, uh, usually it focuses on telling authentic stories. Um, and usually there are voices that are seldom heard. Um, in this particular piece, in this place, I wanted to really uh, show a moment, a moment that of, of depression, but then in that same moment, I wanted to express that the sun is still rising, that there is peace coming in. And as you can see, there's water filling the room. Even in turmoil, there's a peace that you can get. And so, um, you know, just taking this story uh, was important to me uh, to be told. It was told to me. And with a lot of my work, I want um, women to, well, I want viewers to, to look at those images, to look at those stories, those authentic stories of women and, and possibly see their own story. So, um, that's just a little bit of the work I do. Thank you so much. Um, your work is um, exquisite. Um, your images are, I think, um, beautiful uh, without being, oh, how do I describe it? They're not trite and they're not, uh, they're not fashion photography and yet, you know, they all have a quality of beauty in them, um, uh, which goes along with the storytelling. I think it's wonderful. Um, so our next artist is a painter. It's Lysandra Robinson. Lysandra studied painting at Ohio University. In 2019, she completed a residency at Caramu House in Cleveland. Um, recent exhibitions for 2020 that she's been in are Reflections of Me at Loganbury Books. And um, in 2019, Fresh Air Yards Projects, Worthington Yards, downtown in Cleveland. Um, she has been extremely generous with her work over the years and donated a lot of it to charity causes, including eight years of donations to America Scores Cleveland and the AIDS Task Force and Painting in the Park, which takes place in Tremont and raises money for inner city uh, children's art supplies. Um, we have several of her paintings in the exhibition and um, I'm going to turn it over to Lysandra so she can tell you a little bit more about them. 
Hello. Um, thank you. Um, I don't see anything yet, but um, yeah, you're there. You can start. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, this recent work is um, because I reconnected with an old professor and he wanted to see what, what I was working on. And, and then I showed him a lot of my work and he was like, okay, I want you to try to be loose again. And loose is kind of hard for me. So <clears throat> my other paintings are a little more um realistic but i want to try and find a way to um have more abstract more loose painting and for me this came out of it um it still has main ideas i like to paint women i like to kind of show um what people like to hide because a lot of times people kind of hide their true self their inner feelings and um this kind of this work kind of still shows light on the inside and those inner layers and um it still gives me my chance to do um portraits and um i really love color and i can use a lot more um just color to express <clears throat> the you know, different feelings that I have. Um, yeah, this one, see the shared daydream. <clears throat> so these are acrylics, so they work a lot faster for me. I usually paint oil, and um, so these dry a whole lot faster, and I can um, make a whole lot of layers and really let those colors come through. Um, this one's kind of about um, having having like a shared thought or a shared secret with a friend you're close to. <clears throat> and at this one, again, just another one, these portraits, they get to be strong and still show the light that is inside. Um, the backgrounds in these are kind of just matte and they don't have any kind of um any kind of like anything to them really they're just there because all of the exaggerated exaggerated um shadows and and lines and light is coming from the person and the figure so I'm, I'm expanding this work. I'm trying to mix in oils again. I really do love my oils. But um, so right now I'm working on pieces that kind of mix this style with um, some oil. Go. Cool. Thanks, Lissandra. Um, <laughs> You know, I was really happy to include Lissandra's work in the show because she is more abstract than some of the other artists. And, you know, um, with her abstraction, she is trying to show the symbolism of people's inner feelings, inner emotions, inner strength, and inner light. And um, those flat backgrounds that she was describing really make the uh, portraits pop out. And also her color sense is, I think, very interesting and very unique. And, um, and so uh, she makes a really good addition to the show. And she's in position in the gallery next to work by Tony Williams, who is working on paper with batiking. And her abstraction actually has some similarities to the kind of abstraction that you get naturally in that batik material. Um, and so Tony is in fact the next artist that I'm gonna turn the show, uh, the um, presentation over to. You may remember that Tony was the curator of the Art and Thread, which is our first show in the summer after we reopened. Um, and he was he did a fantastic job as curator. 
and um, he graduated from the Art Institute of Pittsburgh, and he also has attended the Cleveland Institute of Art previous to that. Recent exhibitions in 2019 include Waterway to Waterways, a Creative Fusion Fellowship with Praxis Fiber Workshop, the 13th Annual African American Fiber Arts Exhibit in North Charleston, South Carolina, and Contemporary Fibers, a National Jury Textile Exhibition in St. Augustine, in St. Augustine, Florida. Um, I believe he also was in an exhibition in Australia in 2020 and um, sold the beautiful piece that we had as part of Seen Unseen Black Gold in, into that collection. Um, so maybe he can tell you a little bit more about that. Um, his work is in public, public collections as well as corporate. And um, his professional associations here in Cleveland are as a board member for the Morgan Art of Papermaking Conservatory. And he's also a member for the United States Institute of Theater Technology, he has a background in theater arts as well as visual arts, and um, a member of the Ohio Designer Craftsman. So, Tony, welcome to the program. I'm really happy to have you here again and have your work in the gallery. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be with you. Um, in this show, I have two pieces um, and they're both interesting in that they represent a warrior image. Um, for some reason, this year has really brought up um, a feeling of protecting, um, our, our, our essence, which is really important. Um, this first piece, the Akshagba Warrior, um, it, I've been working on critiquing fab paper for about five years now, and this is probably one of the largest pieces I've critiqued. Um, as you know, paper is very fragile, so, you know, in trying to create a piece that's seven feet tall, um, it has some challenges. Um, I really love the way this piece came out in that um, as you stand in front of it, the background kind of disappears. She disappears into the background and then she reappears, um, which is really what the feel of being in the Oshobo region is like. Um, for those of you that don't know, the Oshobo region is where the sacred grove of Forest Shun is located. Oshun is a Yoruba god. She is a deity. She is the goddess of femininity. She is considered to be the creator. Um, so these warrior women would be representative of those that are protecting and guarding her, her sacred realm. Um, the second piece, is the albino warrior who is my homage to Black Lives Matters. Um, she is very defiant in her existence matters, her voice matters, she matters, um, which is something that has really come out and, and is um, extremely important. Um, so I really wanted to express some of the things that are going on in the world. Um, my work is, has really taken on a different approach. Um, it's not as light and airy as it used to be. It's um, searching for deeper meaning. Um, so I'm really looking forward to exploring where this is going. Uh, and um, I've had a wonderful year working with the artist archives. Uh, it's been phenomenal. Thanks, Tony. Tell Thank us a little you. bit about that show in Australia that your um, that Black Gold went to. I'm, um, I'm well, that. Black Black Gold went to Australia to be a part of. 
up uh, the show called Paper on Skin. Um, this year they weren't allowed to do a runway show, so they did a film version of that runway show. Um, so if you look it up online, you can find all 32 pieces of work that were submitted for this year's competition. Um, actually, she is and the other pieces that I sent are still in Australia on display. Um, it's been an amazing year uh, as far as work being seen and exposure. Um, I couldn't ask for more. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, it was, it's been a pleasure working with you as a curator and as an artist. Um, as, as it has been for everyone who's in this exhibition, um, so uh, we're gonna, um, we're, we're ahead of schedule, so we have plenty of time for questions and answers. So I am gonna turn the program over to Megan. I'm gonna put everybody in grid view so you can see everyone. Um, if you have questions, please type them into the Q&A. And if you have a question for a specific person, please put their name in there so we know, so Megan knows who to ask. And if it's a general question, um, you can just put general for everyone and, and we'll try and get everybody to answer. So Megan, I'm gonna turn this over to you. Perfect, I was making sure that my grid is all good. Wonderful, hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for again. And we have these amazing artists on deck and looking forward to uh, asking them some questions. So I'm gonna go in alphabetical order. If anybody has any additional questions, please feel free to enter them in the Q&A right now, just like Mindy said, and preface it with the artist name so I know who I'm asking. So I can usually figure it out, but it never hurts. So the first one I'm going to actually address to Mr. Baker. So Lawrence, I go ahead and unmuted you. And Lawrence, I have one that says, many of your figures, such as the one in Scene Unseen, tend to look off the canvas. Mm, hold on, I'm gonna go ahead and, go ahead and unmute yourself, Lawrence. I wanna make sure we can hear you. There we go. Hello, Lawrence. Hello. Perfect. So um, the question for you is that many of, in your portraits, many of them seem to look sort of away from the viewer, off the canvas, or sort of into corners or different ways. So like the portrait of your wife, is there a particular reason for that? Um, no, there isn't. It's, <laughs> well, the only thing I was trying to do was make sure I complete the um, completed as a composition. I, when I'm trying to help someone, I always try to explain to them there is a difference between a picture and a painting. Okay, and if you can't, your objective should be to make a painting because uh, eventually I can teach you how to draw. And there's other things that go into putting together a piece of artwork or paint. So that, that's, that's why you may see that. Okay, yeah. So it's the idea that it's not so much off the canvas, it's a compositional element. It's part right. of the right. process. The that makes sense. Element. Right. And then I also had one more for you, Lawrence, as well, which was, can you tell us a little bit about uh, why you transitioned from these portraits to the graphic, uh, to the graphite landscapes that you're actually known for today? Um, I think uh, when uh, putting, uh, just copying pictures or making a picture of someone and putting it on the canvas, um, I started paying more attention to what was going on in the background. How can I make the two elements? relate to one another. So uh, I started by putting a shadow space around it. Uh, that's the reason I looked at uh, Fairfield Porter a lot. I looked, I looked at his, his paintings a lot. And before that, it was Alex Cat, where I was just copying stuff, which I wanted to go a little bit further than that. Eventually I did go further by starting with the uh, landscape in, in aspects of the landscape, 
into the pain, and then eventually I just drifted off to uh, graphics. And then I started paying more attention to uh, Vincent Van Gogh um, because I tried to relate to something other than just drawing pictures. So I, I, I try to put it in some historical record. And I looked at Vincent Van Gogh's drawing. And for me, when looking at Vincent Van Gogh's drawing, they were basically designed with uh, different shaped lines. And I, for myself to be an individual, I thought that I would like to go a little further. So I started creating my own variations in lines and what those shapes were going to do to, co to complete a volume or to complete the composition. That's, that's, that was my decision. I love it that there's all this, these historical influences too, but making it uniquely your own to move right. forward with right. it. That's the objective, make it uniquely my own. Uniquely a Lawrence Baker piece. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Lawrence. Let me uh, scoot on down the line. Our next one is going to be for Davon. Make sure that I actually ask you to unmute. There we go. There we go. <laughs> awesome. Hey, how are you doing? Doing good. So there is so much rich just visuals going on in your paintings. And I had a question about talking a little bit more about why the face is absent in on site when the rest of the body is rendered in such just like exquisite detail? Uh, yeah, so um, it started off with me thinking about the fact that my work is, you know, very personal. Um, and I wanted to find a way for the audience to input themselves within the piece as well too. Um, so that's why the face is very much absent um, from that portrait. And I was also thinking about you know, the fact that when I do render this body, I want it to give off a certain allure to it, um, which um, has a negative meaning in itself, just because like in art history, uh, fair skin bodies have been very much, you know, glorified and glamorized in there. Um, and so I use that to my advantage to bring people in, because it's like, I'm looking at a beautiful drawing, I'm drawn in by how glowy the skin is, it's a very light, you know, lighter drawing, but it has a very dark message to it. And it allows yourself to see that and place yourself within that box that, you know, the figure it is accompanied by. So um, that was why I left the face very much blank, um, just because I didn't want people to look at it at excuse this pun, but face value. Uh, but um, I just really wanted people to, you know, pay attention to what, you know, their biases may be when it comes to looking at this type of painting or looking at this type of drawing that a person creates. Um, I wanted them to think about the deeper message to it because with, you know, a fair skin body, you just mainly pay attention to, you know, this is beautiful, but if I replace that with a darker skin body in there, it would immediately go into that negative connotation. So um, I was really playing around with that kind of dual meaning within there so that people would be, you know, attracted to this piece, but also you basically get to draw your attention to that red halo and think about the red sight that's on a gun. Um, and the fact that it's a black body sitting in this seat with a black square behind it, you are also, you know, drawing into that connection as well, too. So it was basically to trick people into, you know, coming into the piece uh, <laughs> and having them think about, you know, this is reality. This is what, you know, life kind of encompasses as well, too. <laughs> well, I, I love that, too. And, and I think that people, viewers resonate in a different way when they if they think a piece is a self-portrait of an artist, they, they sort of, they collapse the meaning. Like they sort of stop thinking about meaning and go, oh, it's, this is the artist's exploration of themselves. But that blankness allows them to actually, to think, to project. And then you do have that contrast. So it's a really, it's a brilliant device. And 
painful because again, the sight of a gun and a halo and then on site, but gorgeous. So everyone come into the galley because I can't even explain how impressive these are because they are huge scale. And it's just, it's remarkable. And we've been a little tricksy. There's a third piece by Devon that's there. We just, we didn't want to give it all away. So you got in, same with all the artists. We, you got to come in, you got to come in if safely. So, well, thank you so much. Um, next one, we're going to go to Jaquez. Hello, Jaquez, how are you? Hello, I'm well. So we got some questions for you, including some, there we go. Okay. Okay, can you talk, a, so, oh, this is a good one, because all your work is body positive and goes for it. Can you talk more about the pieces in the background, specifically that someone was noticing that there might be some sort of uterus and like fallopian tomb, like imagery. Is that something that you intended in the work or is it one of those moments where the, the viewer is seeing their own story too? No, that's exactly what it is, um, a uterus piece. Initially, I had done uh, the male piece, and uh, some of my customers and, and followers asked, well, where's the counterpart? So I decided to go ahead and make that piece. And just recently, I discovered, when talking to a female friend about the term cervix, I'm 46 years old, and I had no idea what that was. And so a nurse friend of mine told me, well, have some homework, go look it up. And I went to Google it and I learned so much. First of all, it was very difficult to find what a cervix does, number one. And then with that, I learned so much in just that study. And then I realized that globally, you know, men don't know anything about the women's reproductive system. Who's gonna teach us? Who? Other than, other than their doctors, we don't know very much. And so with that, I created this piece and, and more pieces will come in which that basic shape is done in mosaic, but around the piece, I talk about uh, the power of the uterus and you know, everyone comes from one, right? Except for, I don't know where clones come from, but most people come from a uterus and and just just the power of it and and I just want uh, people to be empowered by that through these pieces. Another question we have for you too is that have you ever received any um, blowback for you actually having anatomical depictions in your work? Have you ever gotten scuff or have galleries said mm -mm, that's a little too much for us or anything like that? Yes, I have. Uh, and I wanted to tell this story, actually, the very first set I sold, uh, it was in a gallery and it sold the first week. And so I was excited. And then I went back to the shop and they brought, brought the mail piece back. And I wasn't upset, but I, I was curious as to why. And the only reason they received was, oh, I didn't have enough space for that. And so it begged the question, was it because of a spouse? Was it because of family members? Was it because of children? I don't know the answer. And so that's, that's a very interesting thing about these pieces. It, it captures pe people off guard and then they have to decide whether they want it in their space or not because people will talk about it and people will judge it. No, it's, and that's interesting too. A big dichotomy is that we're super okay with female nudes, but the minute there's a male nude in the picture, exactly. whoa, that one comes walking back. I don't think it's a coincidence that, that the gentleman was returned and said to the lady there. So, right. So I think it's wonderful. I'm so glad to have your work, all of your work in the show. Thank you. Thank especially you. That one. Thank you, Chiquez. And actually, uh, Davon, I have, I missed one question for you. So I'm going to double back real quick if that is all right. Yep, that's all right. Excellent. Thank you so much. Sorry, you thought you were off the hook. <laughs> teasing now. So the question was, let me see if it was right. Mm -mm. Oh my goodness. I just had it. Oh, um, it was about the piece in the background. Wait, let me find it right here. 
Okay, it was about the piece in your background. Oh, oh, there we are. It says he mentioned he'd speak about the piece in the background and missed it. Now, is that something you're going to speak on in the artist talk, or do you want to give us a little a little baby preview right now? I can give you guys a little razzle dazzle. Yeah, <laughs> little, give, yeah, the one that because it's it's very beautiful. So we'd love a couple of lines. Please hit us. Thank you. Um, so currently I'm working on a project where I explore a lot of the dark uh, fantasies that have been um, perpetrated, you know, by people who are against, you know, Black Lives Mattering and Black voices and the fact that we are human and all of that. Um, and so I took a lot of those um, negative connotations that they have blurted out towards, you know, us um, and me personally within my life to where um, we get the crappy end of the stick by saying like we're lazy there's like this sort of an absent father theme going on and the fact that we're like um super hypersexual we're deviants and um i compared it to you know a lot of the seven deadliest sins um that show up in the bible and stuff and so this one behind me is representing like lust and greed because a lot of you know, uh, that backlash has to deal with, you know, calling African Americans lustful or greedy. <laughs> and so I've be just been taking these negative connotations and flipping them so that they are not, you know, me depicting myself or others in a negative light. It is literally this person trying to guard their heart. And in a sense, that can seem very, you know, lustful because they have a lust for emotion. They have this lust for protecting themselves. They have this, you know, greediness of like protecting the heart and not wanting anyone to break that heart or anything. Um, and so I've just been flipping that narrative in order to highlight it instead of demonize, you know, myself or others. And so that's like kind of like a snippet of what area it's going into. Um, but I will talk way more about it, you know, in the artist talk um in the future that's right so that awesome i love the seven deadly sins kind of looking at that so there you go a shameless plug for our next program so we'll have again those artist talks on the second and we will have them on the ninth yay i said the ninth but it's the sixth it's the ninth both wednesdays very proud of myself <laughs> thank you so much for giving us that and yeah come back for more on that next one is going to be for amanda king got you unmuted amanda Hi, Amanda. Hi. Oh, man, that was so rich. And I'm an art historian myself. So as soon as that piece walked in the door, I almost blew a gasket and, you know, from Manet to O'Grady. And actually, one of the questions we have was that you mentioned that O'Grady was an influence and that um, even in our discussion that like Anna Mandiana and other performance artists, who are some of your influences that really like at home in, in your work that seems to reflect both personal and this larger canon of work as well? Yeah, so I mean, I definitely think O'Grady's uplifted throughout all of these pieces. And O'Grady's performance art at that time period was not well received. Um, it, it, it was definitely a break from the status quo. It was violent as if she was whipping herself, you know, with, with the rope, but it was also incredibly glamorous and, 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 and sexual and, and provocative. And, and I, I, I just, I identify so much and I, I'm, I'm not sure that I clearly stated um, the symbolism of sort of me and those white gloves being, um, being an artificial cleansing process. You know, I think that being a black debutante was in a way to make me perfect for society, to prepare me to assimilate into a world of capitalism and a world of, um, a world of, of wealth and, and, and money. And, and that's not traditionally equated with the black experience and it, it felt the pageantry of it all felt very unnatural um, and so to be sort of constrained in that representation I felt like in a sense O'Grady being in that gallery and saying I'm an artist look at me listen to me I'm gonna beat myself until you see how 
this oppressive um, art market is how it's impact impacting my creative mindset, how it's impacting um, my work and my body and, and things like that. So I, I think that definitely O'Grady and then Carrie Mae Weems, which I, you didn't see the detail of, of Carrie Mae Weems, but, but that not Manet's type and this tension between Black women wanting to be represented as our whole and authentic selves, but also wanting to be important enough to be in the canon of art history. And in, in Manet's representation of, you know, Olympia, the beautiful white woman, and, 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 and then in Olympia as well, the Black woman who is savage and the servant and someone who is lusting and desiring for that white white beauty, I think in Carrie Mae Weems' piece, which is photographic, um, it's really talking about, you know, how come Manet doesn't see me like as, as, as sexy and beautiful and provocative. And of course, I don't think that Carrie Mae Weems really cares about whether white men think she's attractive or beautiful, but it's the valuation of the black woman and the black body. And I, and I guess I equate that to my, my, the fashioning of like debutante and pageantry of, of, of young black girls and having to perform and, and to put on and, and to be these um, hyper stylized figures um, to be accepted is, 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 is a tension that I've always dealt with. And so when I did that per portrait with Matt, I am, there is a level of the innocence of maybe that little girl that you saw in the portrait with me and my mom who didn't know anything about representation at all. There's that seductiveness and that teasing that, that Carrie Mae Weems had. And then there's that hardness and aggression that says, you know, representations of black women can be diverse. They can be provocative. They can be ironic. Um, and, and, and sort of showing that through my own representation as a, as a photographer who was sitting there for her own portrait. So I will talk a lot more about my art historic references in my artist talk because I think you're going to see how all the pieces are kind of put together tonight. I'm not really putting them together for you, but um, when, when they click, you're going to be like, aha. <laughs> oh, it's gorgeous. And again, like the piece in person, those flowers for everybody to know that they're they're real, they're real flowers. So as the, in, the exhibition continues on, that piece is gonna change. Those flowers are gonna wilt. There's, it is an alive piece that has evolution to it, so. And, and, and the wilted flower is still being a flower and, and a symbol of the black woman body is that how much stress and how much burden, right? The brick, how much burden is on us. You're kind of, gonna kind of see that through the evolution of the, the flowers. So gorgeous. Uh, thank you so much, Amanda. It's gorgeous. So next one, we're going to go to Yvonne. Let me unmute you here, Yvonne. And Yvonne, everybody is captivated with your photographic process. There is a ton. So let's see. So Yvonne, this one is actually from Carolyn Banks. In telling your story in your pieces, do you first find the story or do you let it develop from the photography, from the actual process? I, I find the story. I'm inspired. And um, for instance, I have a piece, uh, it's a self-portrait of myself uh, crying. Um, and it resonated when I was driving uh, past uh, someone in a car and I noticed that they were crying. And it was so, it, it just hit me so hard that I immediately drove home and put this costume on and stood outside and, and began to go through the process of taking pictures to create that image. Um, so uh, I, I'm, I'm normally inspired and I'll sketch it out um, or in, a, in a sketchbook and, and keep it with me at all times. Love it. And there's such a, the quality of the work the way that you work those images, they feel like pastel, they feel dreamlike, they have a lot of, you know, you get the sense of internal space, not just the representation of the world in, in a straight photographic process. And in fact, we do have a question for you from um, one of our archived artists, uh, Stuart Pearl, who's a photographer who's in the audience. And he wanted to know if, he said, Yvonne, as a photographer, I've always been really struck by your powerful images. They are quite memorable. 
do you prefer natural or artificial light or just whatever is best for the specific process? Natural light. Oh. I, I, I follow the light. Um, I will get up early in the morning uh, uh, to shoot before sunrise, I'll wait. Um, and sometimes I need that, that glow. And so I'll wait for the perfect time uh, have all of the pieces, the, the, the costumes, the, if it's not myself, the, um, a model or, uh, and create that environment. It, lighting is key, natural light. And that actually, that's perfect. It leads into, I'm going to combine two, which was that, so do you do a, a digital, uh, this is from Barbara Bechtel and also from James Elves. So one, do you use a digital process to work on your, your prints? And then also, if you do, uh, what is, a, this is a photographer question as well, what software do you prefer to work with your images? Photoshop. Photographers always go technical. I love it. They want to <laughs> know. <laughs> yeah, I understand. Uh, I, I do use Photoshop. Uh, and I, I use layers many images. Uh, the image behind me that actually was the in the Seen Unseen uh, exhibition uh, a year ago, uh, it consisted of about 50 images to make that. So layers upon layers and layers um, to add the depth and in, in the richness uh, of the scene. And that, you know, in, in, in this image, uh, the scene was completely created from my imagination. It does not exist. So, um, yes, compositing, um, layers, and uh, Photoshop. I love it. But it's very important that the reason we list your work, obviously, as digital photography, where some people are, because you do go out and you take photos. This is decidedly Yvonne's work. It's her vision, yes. and that is the foundation versus some artists that they're putting together composites from other source images, which is just a different sort of process. So that's why we wanted to be sure that it is Yvonne's photography and it's stunning. Ah, really? oh, thank you so much. And her, there's so many pieces in the show that are just jaw dropping. So everyone come on in and see it. Next one we have up is for Lissandra. Go ahead and get Lissandra unmuted. Hi, Lissandra. Hello. So a couple of ones for you. This one is an anonymous attendee. Lissandra, I love so many of these pieces. Great work. Could you talk about the women you choose to draw? What attracted you to them? Um, well, a lot of them are not real. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're made up. They're just images I see um, and I just kind of change them. It could be like, three or four different women. I like might like the one person's hair style and, and the shape of somebody's nose. So it's just a mix. I love that they're almost, they're so, so much of your work is internal. You know, the idea that they're kind of like, because you're using more than one like source image, it's like their portraits almost of like every woman in a sense, or like they're, they're more universal than just like, this is a single person too. Yeah. And I, I think it's beautiful and powerful because I think especially that your work is, is focusing on the beauty and power of black women, that they can have this, this identity that is, these images expand more than just, this is my neighbor, or this is my sister, or this is that. It's kind of all of them at the same time. So. Yeah. I have another one for you, Lissandra, and it says you mentioned, since Cassandra Wright, you mentioned your instructor said you needed to be more loose that, and how come, so that it will look like an upcoming work. Oh, so, and then how do you, so how comfortable do you feel about doing? So like, I guess, what does the more loose mean when they say something like that for our non-painters out there? And then also, yeah, let's start there. Let's start there. So what is so my usual work? Is, is more portraits, but they're more realistic. I take forever and get all the details. And with these, I try to reduce the amount of details, but still get the same feeling. Mm. And um, 
I definitely, it's hard for me to just stop and leave it alone. So that's, that's the big challenge to say, okay, that's enough. Yeah. And that's actually, so this is actually the, the last part of the question was like, how comfortable do you feel being loose? So is this a challenge for you to like, to make it loose and more gestural versus very, very detail oriented? Yes, I have to just like stop and look at it for a couple of days and just leave it alone. And if I can deal with it, it's okay. <laughs> the result is beautiful. So thank you so much for being part of this and being in the show. It's gorgeous. So finally, we're going to wrap up with questions for Tony Williams. Let me get you unmuted, Tony. There we go. Hi, Tony. Hi. So we got some questions for you today. So okay. let me just make sure. Okay, good. So first, Tony. Oh, okay. So the so this is a statement. This is from Cynthia. Oh my goodness, it's from Cynthia Lockhart. Cynthia Lockhart yeah. uh, presented for us for the legacy of African American textile arts as part of the Art in Thread, which was curated by Tony Williams, and she was also an exhibiting artist. So. Tony, the journey with your relationship with textiles and history is so interesting. Tell us some more about this aspect of your art. Uh, okay. Um, well, my interest in indigo stems from uh, being in a quilt show in South Carolina and learning the history of indigo and its importance in America and the importance of it in the slave trade and why we were brought to this country. Um, so because of that, I am very interested in the types of fabrics that were used, um, such as say, slave cloth, which is denim, which is not considered, um, unworthy. Um, at one point in time, it was a cloth that wasn't fit for anything but slaves and storing grain in. Um, yet now it's, it's a fabric that has great value. And um, as an African American, we don't necessarily know that history. And I think it's important that we understand it and own it. Um, there is uh, a lot that we have done for this this country, um, and you know our importance in creating this culture called America. Um, so that's where my interest in in textiles and history is connected. Um, you know, from the embellishments that we we put in our clothing, um, the adornment. Um, go to any ch any black church on Sunday, and you'll see how we adorn and adorn and and celebrate our our style, our sense of culture. Um, so that's where my interest lies in in the cultural aspect of textile. I had no idea that that was the history of denim. It, it's amazing. I would want to hear an entire class if you, in a whole lecture. I won't do that to you right now though. <laughs> of just the history of this, it's gorgeous. So, uh, well, thank you so much, Tony. And your work in the show is beautiful. And thank you for your involvement with the Artist Archives this for 2019, 2020, and hopefully in the future too. My pleasure. Well, we're perfectly on time. I'm going to throw us back to Mindy Towsley to do closing remarks and thank you for our funders and some announcements too. So thank you all artists for being so open and beautiful tonight and we really appreciate you being in this show. Thank you. Here's Mindy Towsley. Thanks, Megan. Thanks, everybody. Um, really interesting Q&A tonight. Um, I learned a lot. Um, I do want to uh, say that we do have artist talks coming up on Wednesday, December 2nd from 7 to 8.30 and Wednesday, December 9th from 7 to 8.30. Those will be on Zoom as will all of our programming and, and receptions. 
probably we're estimating until well into 2021. Um, that will depend on how the pandemic uh, plays out. Um, the artists uh, will be split up into those two groups. Uh, Lissandra, unfortunately, will not be part of the artist talks. Um, Lissandra is due to have a, her baby, her second child, probably next week. So um, we're all a little bit on pins and needles. You're going to have to tell us, Lissandra, when that happens. And um, everybody, please, good thoughts for her as she, as she approaches that, that uh, momentous occasion in her life and her family's life. Um, thanks again, everybody, for being part of About Body, About Face. Our gallery is open for the moment from Wednesday through Saturday from 10 to, or I'm sorry, Wednesday through Friday from 10 to 4 p.m. and Saturday from 12 to 4 p.m. You do have to mask up when you come into the gallery and we also wear masks when we're in the gallery. We're practicing all kinds of uh, sanitizing during the day. So surfaces that you will touch are wiped off. Um, we can have a maximum of 10 in the gallery at one time. If you are thinking that you're bringing a group in, please call and just make sure to make an appointment so that you um, can come in and uh, with your group safely. Um, I know that we are under advisement by Cuyahoga County at the moment to not make any unnecessarily excursions to public spaces. Um, so I'm not sure how that's gonna play out within the next week or two um, with the archives and with the gallery space, but as you know, nothing has come down from the state yet. And so far as I can say, I think the gallery is a very safe space for visitors. Uh, we generally do not have a lot of visitors at one time, and it's pretty much one staff person then there at a time. So I think, I think we are safe. So while you can, please do come out and see the show. Um, the show will extend into 2021 for a couple of weeks in January also. So I think that's it. Everybody have a really, really great Thanksgiving. However you're going to celebrate it, do it safely. Um, but do, do have a joyful Thanksgiving nevertheless. And it's been a pleasure connecting with uh, the whole art community and our artists on Zoom. I wish we could do it in person and we will at some point in the future. So let's all just hang on to that as a good thought. So thanks everybody, and we're gonna say good night. Good night. Good night.